This week's podcast is sponsored by the new Bowers & Wilkins 700 series. Every model in this extensive range is inspired by the recording studio and enabled by cutting edge technologies. The new 700 series brings studio sound home with eight elegant high performance models that will suit every decor and preference. Discover more at BowersWilkins.com. Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for Monday the 16th of January. Uh, it's our CES special and I apologise up front. I have the CES lurgy uh, come back with either a cold or COVID, not quite sure which, but yeah, it's knocked me out for a few days, but that always happens. Happens every year. So like I say, this is our CES special. I'm Phil Hinton and I'm joined tonight by our regulars, Ian Colin, Jules and Martin. Good evening, guys. Good evening. Good evening. Good um chat window is open as always if you're watching us live uh, then head over to the chat window uh, ask your questions in there uh, if you can try and keep them ces based uh, tonight uh, and on the subjects that we're going to talk about it will make it easier if you have tv questions in general um then you can save them to the next podcast um where we're going to talk a bit more in terms of tv technology coming up for the year and so on uh, tonight we're going to cover what was announced what we saw or what i saw in person what the guys have picked up in terms of reading news and so on um and we'll give you a brief overview of what we've been looking at so um we're going to do uh, new and updated tv display tech uh, the main tv players that we looked at um, there were other TV manufacturers at CES that we didn't cover. The reason that we didn't cover them was A, uh, no European models um, and no specific models and no real push from them in terms of any coverage. And our CES coverage is different from everybody else out there. It always has been. Um, we take a different view um, to everybody else. It's not about my opinion and seeing me on camera all the time. We speak to the manufacturers. We get the manufacturers to tell us what the products are for the year ahead, what their ideas are for the products, what these products should do, and then we test them. Um, we test the products when they come in, and then we look at whether that is the case. Um, so this is their opportunity. There is a lot of sales talk. You always get that when you're talking to manufacturers. It is a business. They're looking to sell product. But at the same time, it's their opportunity to tell you all about the new tech and so on. And that's always been uh, the way that we've covered the show, is to give them uh, the the floor basically so they can tell us all about the products uh so that's what we're going to discuss tonight and we're going to discuss whether we think they are being genuine with their sales tactics and what they're telling us and whether that technology is going to be there this year but before we get into all of that and um, we haven't caught up uh, since christmas and new year uh so jules very briefly how was your christmas and new year yeah Pretty good, thanks. Um, I binged on The Lord of the Rings, so uh, got the uh, extended editions out, and um, yeah, had a great time uh, watching those with my daughters, and uh, I think the neighbours heard it as well. <laughs> so <laughs> I might have to produce another preset just to reduce the bass a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was good. It was good, thank you. Excellent. Uh, it's always nice to spend time with the family. What about you, Martin? Yeah. What did you get up to? Uh, my brother came down with his family from Edinburgh, so that was very nice. And otherwise, quiet New Year. Uh, went to the pub actually with some friends, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, but I, I during the period I was also ramping up because I'm moving to a new flat in Henley on Thames, and so I've been going through a move, which is always fun. It's never fun at this time of year. Uh, I moved this this time of the year last year, and. Uh... It was actually New Year that we moved, and it wasn't was much fun. Um, so, uh, Ian, I, I, I'm guessing that you played video games. Did you play Christmas Simulator? <laughs> oh, if only that would make life so much easier. <laughs> uh, no, I did actually get out of the house for a little bit. Um, oh, right. I think okay. I mentioned before that I, I got to go back to, to see my family for the first time in a few years because obviously missed out because of COVID. Yeah. So it was the first time I got to do a Chris, like a family Christmas for three years, which was good. Got to see my great niece for the first time as well, which is always a very, very welcome bonus. Excellent. So, yeah, it was good fun from from that side of things. And then, yeah, back in, a little bit of video gaming, quite a lot of Netflix, and then just stretching before CES kicked off. Yeah. And and CES was a lot of hard work. So thanks, Ian. And I need to thank Andy as well um, for their coverage. They didn't get the glamour of Vegas. Uh, they had to sit in the UK. <laughs> Uh, and read press releases is basically producing news from that, which you knew what was going on at the show far more than I did being there. Um, you get a great overview of what's actually going on, what people are talking about. When you're there, 
you're blinded. You, you don't see any of this going on. You don't see any of the... It, it's pointless doing the news conferences. We used to try and do the news conferences, but trying to get from one conference to another, uh, they, each of them 45 minutes, you had 15 minutes to make your way to the next one. Uh, always queues for the next one. Um, it was never fun. And of course, you had no time to turn around um, what you'd just been told. So uh, doing it from the UK, and, and to be fair, a lot of companies as well did a lot of NDAs this year. So we actually had the news written up um, before it, it actually dropped. So that also helps as well, doesn't it, Ian? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I don't begrudge you all the legwork involved. I've done shows in the past and I appreciate that all that running around, it's it's not fun. And like you say, you know, you, you're kind of half guessing what you're going towards, whereas we get a nice orderly yeah. press release, which makes it a lot easier to digest. But then yeah. again, the difference with press releases is that we're very much at the mercy of what they're telling us, where at least on the show floor, you get to see whether those words match what you actually yeah. see first time yeah um and, and we'll get into how just how big the show is and everything else in a minute um so myself at christmas cut short unfortunately because uh, we went all the way up to scotland on christmas eve uh just for my mother to test positive for covid on on christmas day uh, so we had to leave um at that point because we didn't want to come down with that and travel to vegas and not well we wouldn't be able to travel to vegas so unfortunately our christmas was cut short um which is never great and then we flew out on the second um so new year as well was was a bit quiet um mainly packing bags to be honest so yeah it traveled out there and um a very different show since covid um in a number of ways uh, the convention center has grown since i was last there in 2020 a whole new section called west hall um now exists uh, over the road from the main hall you've got a walkway that gets over there um, that was all the automotive stuff and so on. Um, and yes, uh, step count every day was in the 20,000s, um, easily in the 20,000s. And a lot of traveling because not everything happens in the convention center. So I, I think a lot of people would imagine, well, see, yes, you go to the Las Vegas convention center. Um, surely you see everything there. Well, no. Um, the Samsung stand, for example, at the LVCC had no TVs on it. Um, absolutely no new models on there whatsoever. Uh, to see those, you had to go to Caesar's Palace um, into one of the ballrooms there, and you had to have a special invite to be able to go in and see the TVs there. Um, Panasonic, I've seen a lot of backlash um, from some of our American um, viewers saying, how dare Panasonic launch a TV that isn't sold in the US in the US? Well, it's a global show. Um, and again, it wasn't on the show floor. This was in a private uh, suite off of the show floor. You had to have an invite to go there. And of course, they were targeting the European press. Lots of European press head out there. Um, so that's why uh, Panasonic do it. They only show the one model. Um, they will have their launch a little bit later in the year. Sony had absolutely deadly squat um, to show. Uh, I have my suspicions as to why. I think they're waiting on the new MediaTek chip before they uh, announce their TV lineup. Uh, Panasonic, on the other hand, they wanted to go ahead uh, with the existing chip and go with uh, the micro lens array technology. We'll come on to that in a second. So, yeah, um, busy show, and it's not how you expect it to be. Lots of traveling, lots of hotel to hotel, and, uh, yeah, um, traffic's really busy, lots of taxis, monorail you can't get on, and all the rest of it. It is a nightmare. So we're going to come back and talk about that in a second. So let's get on with the show. If you'd like to support the AV Forums podcast on a regular basis, then why not become a patron? Head over to patreon.com forward slash AV Forums to sign up. You can also make a one-off donation through the Super Chat or via streamlabs.com forward slash AV Forums. All donations help us to improve the website and the podcasts. Thank you to all our supporters. So we've got some new patrons. Who wants to introduce them? Jules? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, we have uh, Mr. Twinkle, which is a great name. Um, then a very clever name. That's not my name, which is uh, spelt obviously like the uh, the AV equipment. Count Jedi, Brendan Kelly, Roger Tinsley, and Marcus. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you very much for your support, guys. Um, if you do want to support us, obviously, you've just had all the details in there, but just a quick reminder, streamlabs.com forward slash AV forums, or you can use the YouTube super chat. And of course, uh, go and join us as a patron. You get a lot of uh, extras bundled in. Um, you get early access these days, so you can read our reviews way ahead of everybody else uh, with early access. So go and have a look at patreon.com forward slash AV forums as well. 
Uh, come competitions, what can people win, Ian? Uh, people can currently win uh, three prizes. We've got three competitions on the go at the moment. First up, there is an Optima Cinemax, uh, Cinema X, rather, D2 Ultra Short Throw Projector with a NVIDIA Shield TV Pro bundle, uh, which is worth over £2,000. Uh, that prize comes courtesy of scan.co.uk. You can also win a Denon Home Rage 350 wireless speaker system worth £599. That comes courtesy of Peter Tyson. And last but by no means least, you can win a Sony uh, ZV-1 camera, which is worth £519, and that comes courtesy of MPB. Uh, find all those on avforums.com slash competitions. Excellent. Go win some prizes. Uh, of course, uh, that's the hardware side of things. No movies podcast tonight because this is a CS special. Movies podcast is back on the 30th, along with a normal hardware edition. But uh, lots of movies there. Uh, so if you're a movie fan, you want to win some 4K Blu-rays and so on, head over to the competition page as well. There's always stuff to win. And again, if you're a patron, there are patron-exclusive competitions as well, where you have far better odds in terms of winning things. So go and have a look at that. Like I say, chat window is open tonight. We're going to get stuck right into uh, our CES coverage, what we saw and and so on. Uh, but if you do have uh, questions, get them into the live chat if you're watching us live. If not, if you're watching a little bit later in the week, uh, you lo- listen to the audio-only version or so on, uh, it's podcast at avforums.com or leave us a comment in the podcast forum underneath this podcast and we'll get around to answering those as quick as we can. There's a few uh, questions just come in. So, uh, Sir Andon, do you guys know if TCL will be using the Pentonic chip? Uh, No details on that at the moment. Did ask a question. Uh, It was dodged. Make of that what you like. Uh, I think they're they're ready to uh, discuss that. Panasonic, uh, unable to use new media tech chips. Well, they're they're not in there. Uh, The the latest ones are not in the the latest Panasonic TV. They've gone with micro lens array. They want you to get that out uh, quickly. Uh, Sony range, I uh, believe announcements will be coming in the next four or five weeks. Don't hold me to that, but that is that is the rumour mill at the minute that we will get to know what the TVs are in the next four or five weeks. And as soon as we get to know them, you'll know that as well. So thanks for the question, uh, ASL. Uh, you also said, hope your mum uh, fully recovered. Um, it's taken a while, but she has. But thank you very much for asking that. It is appreciated. Um, Paul Munger, do you think LG OLEDs will compare to uh, Samsung's second gen QDs? We're going to discuss that in a second, so hang around, Paul, for that. Um, and there's a, a few other questions there that we'll be getting around to. Um, and Zamir, like I say, you know, five, six weeks, maybe maximum in terms of women or what Sony are going to be doing. Certainly in the UK, um, I can't talk uh, global. I don't know global, but certainly rumours are UK will be within that time frame. Uh, right, okay, and uh, TCL announcing the European lineup. Uh, as soon as they do, Marek will be on the podcast. Um He's due to come back anyway, so uh, as soon as they do announce that, then Marek will join us on the podcast and we'll discuss that. So let's get stuck into what we're looking at. And of course, the new display technology is always uh, what interests us. And of course, micro lens array is a big story for uh, WRGB OLED. It's something that's been developed by LG Display. I know I have to explain this all the time and I hate doing it, but I do know that people do get confused. Um, LG Display are a completely separate company to LG Electronics. LG Electronics are who make the TVs that you buy. So the C-series, G-series, and so on. LG Display are the people who make the panels. Um, And they don't only sell those panels to LG Electronics. They also sell them to everybody else in the market, such as Panasonic and Sony and other vendors that use their panels like Philips. Uh, So it's LG Display that came up with uh, MLA, which is Micro Lens Array. Um, Very, very simple tech. all it does is it uses tiny little lenses. I mean, really, really tiny little lenses. And it redirects light that is lost within the panel, which normally goes back into the panel and directs it out of the way. Uh, and by doing that, it boosts the brightness of the panel. And it is a, it's a definite step up on last year's panels. Um, again, what I'm going to be discussing here are manufacturer demos. Uh, you always take a manufacturer's demonstration with a huge, massive truck full of salt um, because they only have demonstrations to highlight their products and what the market message is and what they want to get that message across. So take it with a pinch of salt. But yes, um, there is a difference in the demonstrations that I saw. So demonstrations from LG and from Panasonic um, in terms of the technology. LG Electronics are not headlining with MLA technology. They're doing the whole OLED Evo thing where they're clumping it all in under a different name 
uh, to do with the process and to do with MLA, to do with the new panel and the new heatsink and so on. Uh, that's their message, whereas Panasonic are being a bit more deliberate in terms of they are mentioning the fact that they use a micro lens array. Uh, I have a feeling that Philips will do the same uh, if they use the same panels. And Philips, uh, the, their thing is 7th and 8th of February. I don't know if there's an embargo in terms of what we can tell you, but that's certainly when we're going to get to know uh, the new range because they don't do uh, CES. The reason for that is Philips is a different company in the US. Um, so to save any confusion, they stay well away. Uh, so yeah, so micro lens uh, LG display technology, it does work. Um, there is a definite boost in brightness um, and it's uh, it, it also helps with colour. Um, there was a difference in terms of colour and the HCX processor on the Panasonic uh, MZ2000 was doing some great things with colour. Uh, certainly there will be a, a boost in terms of colour volume, but it won't be the same as QD OLED. Um, it's not an RGB display, um, a genuine RGB display. It still uses a white pixel and white booster, so um, it won't have the same colour volume as a QD OLED. But to be really frank with everybody out there, um, I know there's a lot of hype in terms of YouTubers and all the rest of it, they're all looking for clicks and video watches and all the rest of it. So they have to hype up and, and do the, the whole clickbait thing. Um, there's not a huge difference between QD and WRGB. Um, you get the two panels next to each other calibrated. There is not a huge difference. Uh, QD pushes red a bit more, you know, red's a bit fuller. Um, certainly Samsung have been over pushing the red aspect of their image on QD. Um, and I know that Jules has looked at both of the uh, technologies this last year when the calibrated jewels there's very little that actually with film content there's very little that actually uh, points out the differences between the panels yeah subtleties um there you know there there are differences i do like that sort of boosted color volume on the qd oleds um i can see it um but it's not night and day no um you know so um so yeah, we've got two. I'm quite excited by next year actually by these by these announcements. Um, the reported luminance increases are not insignificant in those top models. It's obviously not going to be so much lower down if you look at the C3s, um, but um, it's um, it's very promising. Mm. And and in person and again, big pinch of salt because they are manufactured demos. But uh, in person, they did look very very good, and I'm I'm really desperate to get these in and get them tested and measured the way that we do but that's micro lens array we'll come back to um the tvs in question a little bit later i want you to cover that first of all uh, the next thing i want you to cover was micro led tvs this is the future this is the holy grail um it's also still mega expensive they are having real issues in terms of uh, yields um if they can't get the yield rate up um then it remains very very expensive it is a rich man's toy at the moment and that's likely to remain the case for quite some time. So you can go into Harrods and you can buy a 240 inch um, micro LED TV if you want to. Uh, you're going to pay a few hundred thousand pounds for the privilege at the moment. Um, we saw smaller sizes from Samsung. Um, so very briefly, Samsung usually hold a, an early look event. It's normally really well organized. Normally you'll have a keynote, um, you know, a 10 minute keynote from one of the directors of display or whatever, um, telling you what the new technology is for the year, what the new models are likely to be and so on. And then normally a curtain drops behind them and all the models are set out and you get to wander around and have a look at, at what's what. This year, they basically opened a door and said, there you go, there's the new TVs. Um, no cards next to the TVs to tell you what they were, nothing to tell you what the models were, what the technology was. Um, and the reps that were on the show floor um, I am guessing, but they appeared to be staff from retailers, Samsung retailers who had been given a script um, to follow a script. So if you had any technical questions or any questions, any detail about what was being shown at this Outlook event, um, you weren't getting very full answers. You basically had to, uh, had to be detective and try and figure out what you were actually looking at. So I have fed that back to my contacts at Samsung and um asked it if they do that in future maybe give us i don't know maybe give us a reference sheet that to take with us when we go in so we can you know match the numbers up and then see what the the models are that we are actually looking at 
Um, but after a little bit of detective work, I did get to see two of the new QD OLED uh, models, uh, the 90 and the 95. 95 is going to have a one connect box, which is great. Um, that makes wall mounting a lot easier. Um, you just got the one cable that runs up to the TV for power and so on. Um, or if you use it on the stand, the one connect box can sit on this on the back of the stand. Great solution. Um, so yeah, uh, getting back to micro LED, Samsung had them all lined up on this early look. No information other than there were smaller screen sizes. So I think it went from 50, 50 inch upwards. Uh, to about 140 inches or 150 inches along one wall, um, which was great to see. I would love to have had a bit more detail from Samsung on that, and I'd love to have had somebody to tell me exactly what it was I was looking at, because it did look impressive. But again, uh, we've seen 75-inch be muted to be launched, and it didn't happen because of COVID and a few other things. So um, micro-LED, it's great tech. It is the future. Um, it's the holy grail of TV because it does everything that OLED does fantastically well and everything that LCD can do in terms of peak brightness and overall 100% brightness and colour volume and so on. Um, marry those two technologies together and it's it's absolutely brilliant. Um, the, the problem is it's just too damn expensive. But the same happened with OLED. You had a number of years where the yields just were not... Uh, very good they were under 50 percent and then all of a sudden they they managed to fix that and it went to 80 percent yield and then the prices started to drop and it became a viable product then so we're, we're just waiting on that uh micro led so samsung showed us some uh, as well as tcl uh, tcl had a micro led on their stand as well and again looks very impressive it's a future still five to seven years away i think um and the other new technology was second generation qd oled um there is a new uh uh, blue OLED uh, light, which is more efficient, is brighter. Um, that obviously then uh, reacts with the QDs for red and green. Uh, so you get your RGB. Um, that's what makes QD OLED excellent. Hopefully second gen builds on the uniformity, which Jules will back me up on this. Yep. Panel uniformity is absolutely superb on these panels uh -huh. last year. Mm. Um, why is that important? Uh, it's important because you do, you get pure white so if you have white on the screen it, it, it's white there's nothing there that distracts in any way you don't get any vignetting around the edges where it's a little bit darker than the center everything looks uniform um uh -huh. you don't get any dirty screen effect you don't get any lines uh when you put a just above black uh slide you don't get any of the the banding that's seen on on some of the lg display panels so uh, that is a big plus point for qd and hopefully that will continue with second gen the extra brightness is, is also great. Um, you're looking at, they're saying 2,000 uh, to 2,500 nits. Calibrating mode, I'm not sure it will hit that, maybe 1,300 nits, which mm -hmm. is a big step up. Mm -hmm. um, I think D65 mode would probably yeah. be looking about that as well. So that was a new technology. Have I missed anything, Ian, uh, in terms of new technology? Um, I don't think so. The only thing, the only thing, other things we had on the list, we want to talk about uh, the uh, MediaSec stuff a bit later. That yep. was something that was touched on um, was the LG Signature OLED M, the wireless uh, consumer TV. I don't know whether that was something you wanted to touch on now or maybe come to you later on. Well, let's quickly touch on that because it is a new technology um, or is it a new technology? Uh, we've seen this before with 1080p uh, HDMI. I think Panasonic showed it a number of years ago um, with HD signals. It was something that they showed at one of their conventions. Um, never came to market. Uh, power as well. We've also seen wireless power to TVs. Again, that's never really come to market. This is a genuine product. This will be coming to market. Um, certainly the uh, the large TV I saw, I think it was a 98 inch um, that we saw there was a signature model. Um, if an LG product has signature on it, uh, that basically means bloody expensive. Um, and that is expensive. I mean, the rollable was 100,000 plus um, so that kind of gives you an idea of what you're talking about when it comes to signature models. Um, it was line of sight, but it, it's quite clever technology in terms of the box. You set the box with your components. So you can have the components other side of the room. You can have the TV at, at the other end. There's nothing on the TV other than a little receiver uh, that sits underneath the panel, um, almost like a power light on a normal TV. Um, it's just under the panel. As long as the, the box can see that, in whatever way, it, whether it bounces off a wall and can see it or off the ceiling. Or, as long as it can see it, it will transmit the signal. There is no latency there that I could determine with uh, what we've been showing. There was a thing on top of the box that 
you could spin it uh, and point it towards the TV. Um, so if the box was sitting to one side and the TV's off 45 degrees, you spun this thing 45 degrees and you made sure it was pointing at the TV and the TV would, would get the signal. Um, if you have a lot of people standing in front of the transmitter to the TV, it found a different way of sending the signal. Um, so it was quite clever in that respect. I didn't see any breakup or anything. Is it the answer to a question nobody's asking, though, um, Martin? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, unless you completely want to hide all your equipment. I mean, I think I did see your video about that, where it's got to be, well, it can't be more than about 10 feet, I think, yeah. away. And he said, definitely don't shove it in a cabinet or anything like that. Yeah. Um, not a product for me, but an interesting one. Yeah. And the thing for me, and if you've seen the video, and please do go and have a look at the video and leave a like, it is a big box. You know, you're not talking about a little, uh, you know, a little puck or anything like that. This is a big box with a fan inside and, and all the rest of it. So and not a very pretty one either, I would no, say. No, not a pretty one. But again, it's new technology. Uh, they're testing the water with this. Jules, is it something that would interest you? I mean, you go into a lot of people's homes. Is it is it a solution that people may be well, looking for? I'll tell you what, I've got scars on the back of my hand from trying to get HDMI cables in the in the in the back of these uh, these TVs that are really flat against the wall. Um, so from that point of view, yeah, that'd be very nice just to plug it in somewhere else and um, have it wirelessly sent to the TV. It's going to cost extra, obviously, as a technology. Are you really that bothered? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think the question you ask is 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 totally right. They are they answering a question nobody's answer, asking really. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's nice. It's nice to see. Um, wireless is definitely going to become a thing um, as we move forward. The more things that become wireless, and we're going to come on to that when we talk about the Nakamichi, um, which is totally wireless. So, so yeah, um, those were the new technologies. I see somebody's asking if we're reading the chat. Um, we will be coming back to the chat tonight. So if you are watching live, uh, just give us a little bit of time and some patience. We will come back around and answer uh, the questions as we go along. Um, and if I don't hit your question tonight, uh, do put it in the thread and I will personally answer your questions in the thread. I do promise I will do that this week. Um, you know, we, we do that. We, we don't come along here and, and just sprout our opinions. We will answer your questions as well if we can. Um, so this is maybe a, a break point where we can actually uh, do that right now. So um, we'll just go through and uh, how much do you think the 85 inch Hisense U8K will be sold for in the UK? I've no idea on that one, but it, it, it is a premium model for Hisense. This is a gamble for them. Um, but they've definitely listened to the feedback. And the first thing the guy said to me when I met them on the Hisense stand this year was, listen, Phil, we are listening to what you and your members are saying in terms of you want the same TVs that the US get and so on. So this year it is a global um, product lineup in terms of the TVs. Um, so the panels that the US get will be the same panels that the UK get. The only difference will be the smart systems because uh, they do vary from market to market on some of the models. Um, and then you get Vida on the, on the more expensive models. In terms of pricing, I don't want to say at the moment, because I don't know, basically. Um, we will get more details on that. We will have high sense on the podcast. This is something we will be doing this year a lot more of, is getting the manufacturers on and uh, quizzing them about the models and so on. So stay tuned for that. And as soon as we get pricing, uh, you guys will be the first to know, whether it's through Ian's news stories um, or through the podcast. Um, let me see what else. Did I see the, the AWOL uh, 3500 UST? No, I didn't get an opportunity to see many USTs. Apologies for that. Um, like I was saying right at the start, CES is manic. Um, there's only two of us out there, um, myself doing a lot of the filming and Michelle who does a lot of the admin work and everything else behind the scenes to make sure uh, the meetings run uh, on time and all, all the rest of it. It's very, very uh, time restrictive when you're out there. So we, we really just want to concentrate on things that everybody wants to know about, which is TV. Um, so apologies we didn't get around to everything that's on there. Uh, but it is a massive, massive show. Uh, and I think to do it justice, you need, need a team of about 20 uh, people out there just to cover three or four of the holes. That's not covering absolutely everything. The other thing to point out is that um, a lot of the meetings that we had and a lot of access that we do have to see these TVs do not happen on the show floor. They happen in hotels and hotel suites. And what you, you end up doing is we, well, what we do is we rent a car 
Uh, and you basically end up driving from hotel to hotel, parking up in the parking lots, finding which suite you need to be in, go and do your thing, back in the car to the next hotel, um, which is very uh, time restrictive again. So just so you get an idea of just how busy it is, and you, you've only got four days really um, to absolutely cane the show, do everything you want to do and so on. So apologies that we don't cover absolutely everything, but we try and cover at least the main things. Uh, somebody asked about the Displaced TV. I got some um, first-hand knowledge from somebody else who I respect and their opinion, and they said not worth covering um, because it very much is a prototype um, and there wasn't anything there that, that's going to make any sense for a, for a few years. So interesting tech. This is the completely uh, wireless battery packs, TV and all the rest of it. Um, you get these products now and again, they're looking for, um, you know, to, to be the one thing that, that goes viral or whatever. Unfortunately, that fell flat in its face, that that TV, um, which is the reason why we didn't put any time into that one. So apologies, we didn't get that. Um, TCL announcing the 2023 lineup will, again, uh, as soon as uh, they announce that, Marek will be on uh, the podcast for that. Uh, waiting for the review on the TCL uh, 835. So I will be reviewing the 835 and the 935 from TCL. These models will be... Um, valid models until the middle of this year so i'm still going to cover those tvs uh the tvs come from poland um so there's been a little bit of a delay getting the tv samples over uh, as soon as i get them in they will be reviewed so stay tuned for that um and i can't see anything else um at the moment so we will come back to uh to these and again if you can try and keep it ces related in terms of questions uh i've seen that there's some uh, some people asking for picture settings and so on um come back to us on a regular podcast for those and we'll try and uh, get those done so it's choosing music uh, we'll, we will uh, do that uh, at another time uh, this is ces tonight right so uh let's move on to some other new technologies uh, that were announced um the big thing that i think most of the media out there missed this and i don't know why Big story, uh, TCL, uh, 8K, RGB, true RGB, uh, inkjet printed OLED. So this is a new manufacturing process for OLED TVs. Um, TCL have been pushing this in the background. This was the first time this has ever been shown in public, and people just walk past it. You stand on the, on the, the site and, and on the stand, and nobody showed any interest in it, which I thought was amazing because... Uh, if TCL managed to nail this approach, like I say, true RGB, uh, they're able to do it at 8K at 65 um, at the moment. That's a lot of pixels in a TV. Um, and of course, they're using inkjet printed, which cuts down the cost in terms of the mass producing these things. Um, I found that fascinating. Um, the TVs looked amazing. Uh, picture quality, fantastic. As you would imagine, uh, true RGB. So you're getting that color volume of QD OLED. Um, right there on, on a, a TV that should be a lot easier uh, to produce. And of course, TCL being a Chinese company, they have the, the resources to put behind uh, this technology and get it out to mass market. So something that interests you, Jules? Yeah, um, uh, it's not something I'm, I've been, has been too much on my radar um, at the moment, but uh, um, just sort of looking up on that thing, <laughs> isn't the uh, the LG EP950, um, which I've calibrated uh, for some colorists, um, that inkjet printed um, monitor? It, it could be. Inch? I, it could be. I, I'm not 100% sure of that, but they had a 31-inch panel yeah. on the stand. So. That could be. It could be uh, very but similar. And anything that promises to um, improve yields, cut down cost, is a good thing. Um, you know, it leads to to everyone more affordable uh, displays yeah. for us all. Um, so yeah, I mean, it sounds very interesting. Every time you mention inkjet, though, I'm thinking of my Canon bubble jet printer. That I know, I had that's, back that, in. that's the problem. <laughs> that's the problem. And I think maybe calling it inkjet, which yeah. this is the process it is. But I think people have just looked at that and then moved on. Uh, and not mm. actually realise the significance of mm -hmm. what it is that they're actually looking at. Um, and again, maybe it was uh, pitched wrong on on the stand. I don't know, but Marek was very uh, very interested in getting us in front of that. Mm. Um, and like I say, it's the first time publicly it's been shown. It's been shown at some uh, professional trade shows like NAB, uh, but I think this is the first time it's actually been shown at a public consumer uh, electronic show. So yeah, really interesting. And of course, RGB again. Um, you know, you want an RGB display uh, to get the best, best possible color volume and so on. Yeah. 
and it certainly looked bright enough as well. So that was really promising tech. Uh, and again, something that could really cut the price of OLED and get a lot more uh-huh. mass market, which is what we want. I mean, LCD TV has done a great job at the lower end of the market and, and keeping people happy with reasonable picture quality. But um, if we can get OLED down into that price point and, and get that into people's homes, I think uh, it's a big step up in terms uh-huh. of picture quality. Um, Absolutely. Something that interests you, Martin? Um, yes. Uh, any manufacturing processes do me, but I'm not sure I completely understand. I mean, is it, it's, it's a basic 3D printer model, is it? But it's uh, creating the innards from that. It, it, my brief understanding of it, and again, it's all patents and propriety, and, and they're not going to go into it in any great detail, but basically uh, in the manufacturing process, they can print the OLED uh, material directly onto uh, the substrate, um, which then cuts out a lot of the manufacturing process and improves your yield rate. And anything that improves your yield rate means that in terms of your scalability um, and bring it to market in terms of pricing and so on is a lot better. Um, so, yeah, it's really, really interesting. Uh, it's the first time it's been publicly shown, and, and it was great to see that. That's the type of thing that I like from CES. The other thing is that my first contact with TCL was probably about 12 years ago, 10 or 12 years ago, with the big 3D push at the time. Um, and they were the manufacturer. They had a tiny stand in Central Hall. And there is a video on our YouTube if you want to go and search it out. Um, I think it's CES 20, uh, 2009 or 2010, um, where we interview the guy, and he's talking about Glasses 3 3D. And it was a Glasses 3 3D TV that was being shown. And it was just so funny. I was I, I was having this discussion the day before we went on the TCL stand. I said, well, I remember... Uh, the year that this was shown and it, it kind of fell flat in his face but it'd be great if they could come up with something like that and lo and behold they had the glasses 3 3D TV on the stand um, signage I have to say this straight up it's a signage display um, so it's not designed to show 24 frames per second movies or anything like that so I'm going to get that out there straight away in case people are like yeah 3D TV's coming back uh, no unfortunately it's not coming back anytime soon even if you know, James Cameron is uh, releasing films still in that format. Um, but it, again, it was interesting to see how far that technology had moved on. Um, and there are a couple of laptops coming up this year as well, which use very similar technology uh, without glasses. And um, it uses processing and two cameras in the top of uh, the laptop that measure where your eyes are. Only one person can watch it, but usually when on a laptop, there is only one person using the laptop. It measures your, your where your eyes are and, and it uses the whole parallax thing to put the object in 3D space so it sits a little bit out from the screen and so on. So the same type of technology, this is for signage. So if you're walking past uh-huh. a building or whatever, you know, and, um, you know, Spielberg's son's releasing Jaws 19 and the shark's coming out towards you, um, that this is this that technology, basically. It's not hologram technology. It's just a, a screen that gives you that 3D parallax of effect. And it is really, really good. Um, and the only other bit of new tech, and I know this is one for you, Jules, that you're going to be really uh, happy about. Um, I met up with Derek Smith. Um, so Derek's a long time collaborator with AV Forums. Um, basically, he is the guy who uh, invented Kalman, which is a software that myself and Jules use um, on a regular basis, have done for um, probably nearly two decades now. Um, I remember it when it used to be a spreadsheet. Uh, Apparently and, so. And it did. It started out as a spreadsheet and then it moved on to what we know now. Well, Derek's the guy who's behind that. He's the guy that was behind uh, Spectrical, as they were back then, uh, then bought out by Portrait Displays. Uh, but Derek's still there as the CTO. Um, and it was great to see him again. Uh, I haven't seen him for such a long time. Uh, we are f- Facebook friends, but uh, meeting face to face, I haven't done that in a long time. So it was great to catch up with Derek again and talk about MediaTek, uh, the new uh, Platonic, um chips and the fact that they are Kalman ready. So what does that mean? Well, up until now, when manufacturers wanted to have Kalman ready on their TVs, Derek has taken about two years of his time to develop the software and the interface and everything else. Uh, They would talk 
from the software to the TV and vice versa, and then right up the lookup tables and so on back to the TV. So the calibration that you perform is then loaded into the TV. And then every time you go to that preset, it loads the 3D lookup or the 1D uh, lap or whatever it is that you've calibrated on that particular TV and then displays the calibrated image. Uh, MediaTek have looked at this and thought that is great technology. We're going to put this into our new uh, TV chips and most of the vendors out there, apart from LG and Samsung uh, who do their own silicon, uh, most of the other companies out there buy their silicon um, and buy it from MediaTek. So if they have this new chip set and it's activated, all these new TVs that then come to market will be calm and ready. And what that means is that uh, if you are a professional calibrator, you can hook up directly to uh, these TVs and do autocal straight out of the box. Uh, pattern generator built in as well. Um, so if you don't have a pattern generator, it will generate the patterns as well, uh, specific to that TV. So you can calibrate, um, rewrite, and you can rewrite um, the lookup table. So what you do is you go in and you can actually wipe um, the uh, uh, the board uh, to the board level. You can wipe that picture mm -hmm. uh, preset out and then um, calibrate your 3D lookup table and then load that into the TV mm -hmm. uh, directly. So it always reads that lookup table. It's always accurate. It's always bang on. Mm -hmm. This is fantastic tech. This is stuff that we were talking about 20 mm -hmm. years ago and saying, wouldn't it be great if each TV that you went out and bought had this capability? Mm -hmm. um, now, these chips will have the capability. Whether the TV has the capability or not is something down to the manufacturer. So if it's a lower range model, they may not switch on uh, this and license this side of the chip. Um, but certainly in, in most of the higher end, mid to higher end TVs, uh, Derek was was confident that the, the capability would be there. Um, also, what was quite surprising was the number of manufacturers that had been in to see it. And a lot of these that developed their own silicon who'd been in to see it as well. So whether they were just spying on competition or maybe they're looking at a cost uh, basis and is it you know cheaper for them to use this chip with this capability rather than developing their own thing and having uh, Portrait develop their own thing for their models. It's interesting. It's something to really concentrate on if that's uh, of interest to you. But what it means at the end of the day, guys, is it makes it easier for the consumer at the end of the day to have a calibrated TV. And that's always been something that AV Forums has always uh, put yep. first and foremost accuracy, image accuracy. We want that. Um, and this means that all manufacturers should have that capability if they use these chips. And three different levels of chips, as I understand it, each with their own um, uh, little uh, incremental differences. Uh, but calm and ready should be on all of them. Um, Will they be in projectors as well? At the moment, I'm not sure on that one, Martin. That's certainly a question that we'd have to ask to contacts at JVC and so on. But um, I'd, I'd love to see projector manufacturers go down this route. I know Jules would as well, because calibrating a JVC um you know, excuse the French, can be a real pain in the arse. Um, you need to go, you know, to the far end of a fart sometimes with some of these things. So, yeah, this this would be great if, if we could have this technology where you're basically plugging in what you need to plug in and calibrate straight away. I don't know what Jules' thoughts are on that. You spend more time yeah. with projectors than I do. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, it sounds exciting. It sounds like the democratisation of, of calibration. Um, it sounds like, you know, what we're kind of doing with LGs at the moment will can spread out to other displays very easily. And you mentioned 3D LUTs and, you know, my, uh, my heart skips a beat um, because you can get them the most accurate mm -hmm. image um, yeah. on your display to, you know, um, to rival the accuracy on grading monitors, you know, so it, it's, it's the way to go. Um, and currently at the moment, 3D LUTs on, on projectors only, you've got to get a video processor in there, like a Lumagen or a MadVR. Yeah to achieve that and they're and they're really expensive yeah, um absolutely. so that would be interesting yeah very interesting i mean this is uh the holy grail as as derek put it, in, in terms of what he's been doing since he you know launched his company this this was always what he wanted to see so it's great that they're finally doing this um it'll be interesting to see where it goes uh, mm -hmm. and how many other manufacturers also also use the chip and use it to the full capability that that that's there um but yeah, that, that got me excited. That was that was something that I, uh, it was the, one of the first meetings that I booked in. Um, I, I definitely wanted to see this technology because it is so promising. Um, and again, it opens it up for enthusiasts. And this is one thing I've always tried to push. And 
there are places for people like Jules. Um, there always will be pl- places for professional calibrators to go out and calibrate uh, displays properly. Um, Jules, it, what's your ratio in terms of uh, consumer to professional client? If you don't um, probably 60-40, 60, 60, 60 consumer and, and then 40% professional, yeah. you know, studios or um, integrators. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the beauty of this is um, the only thing you really need to buy is a meter. Mm. if you're an enthusiast and a license for Calman home um and that can still be a little bit expensive but it opens it up to enthusiasts uh, i think it, the, sorry sorry phil yep i was Go gonna on. say i was gonna say it all sounds great but the bottleneck will be the meter it will be um, and then to explain that yeah you can get some pretty decent meters at low prices but they're only decent for a certain number of yeah. months or yeah. if you're lucky a year and then they need to be recalibrated mm-hmm. um, or they need to be reprofiled um, when you're talking about accuracy and meters I mean we've just got ourselves a new meter for for the reviews and, and you're talking a lot of money mm-hmm. an awful lot of money um, which is great if you're a professional because you offset that against your business it's tax deductible and then you know you, you that's part of your fee going out to a client, you know, part of part of what they're paying for is your knowledge, your expertise, and your equipment, and how accurate that equipment is. Uh, they're not going to have that at home. Um, but again, it opens it up for enthusiasts. I mean, you were an enthusiast. I was an enthusiast. Uh-huh. We used to tinker around with spiders and all the rest yeah. of it, and you know, free French software and just to That's learn right. what we were doing before we went on professional yeah. training courses, before we did it, uh, you know, as a career. Um, so I'm always keen to get enthusiasts involved, and this this looks like a, a really good way of doing that. Um, so yeah, that was new technology. Great to see. Uh, right, so we need to move things on. Uh, I am keeping an eye on the chat just to see if anything else comes up, um, and we'll answer that as we uh, go on. Uh, right, um, new TV ranges. Now, there wasn't a lot of new TV ranges announced. Um, as we said before, Sony have announced nothing, uh, expecting something in February, maybe early March. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. That's the rumours at the minute. LG did announce models. So you've got A3, B3, C3, G3, Z3, and M3. Now, M3 was a signature wireless. Um, Z3 is their 8K panel. Again, big money for those. The ones that AV Forums members are going to be really interested in. Uh, A and B are your entry-level models, the same as they they always have been in in the range. So it's C and G that we're looking at. Um, LG really making a push to separate G out from C. Um, So three years ago, C and G were the same, just a different design. So it was the same panel, same processor. Um, the only difference was the cosmetics of the of the TV. Uh, they've really kind of gone the other way with this, Jules, haven't they? Um, they have. We saw, it, we saw it last year with G2. Yeah. Um, significant brightness up, uh, up on compared to the C2. Um, more features on there. Obviously, the panel with the heat sink and so on. Yeah. Done the same with G3, so there's a little bit more brightness on there. Obviously, you've got MLA technology, although they're not saying it's MLA. Uh-huh. It's on there, so micro lens array. Um, we've got some videos out there, so go watch the videos if you want in-depth details of the models. Uh, Dave Sepperson was kind enough to give us interviews. Dave's a great guy. He's been there uh, quite a long time. Dave actually works in Korea uh, with the marketing team out there. Um, he knows what's coming along. He knows the technology inside out and so on. Uh, great guy. So he does uh, a couple of interviews with us on that. Uh, so go and check them out. Uh, check out the Picture Wizard. It's something that Jules and I won't spend any time on whatsoever. But, you know, you've got to give people choice. And this this is about giving people choice. Phillips do their vivid mode or crystal clear, as they call it. Now, um, LG do Picture Wizard, which basically says, which image do you like the look of? This one, this one, this one, you choose one, and then it'll give you another thought, and you choose it. And then it'll come up with, do you like really bright and colourful images? And <laughs> we're going to turn everything up to max. And if that's your thing, then great. You get the opportunity for that um, with their picture wizard. There's a video on that with the C3. Um, and then, of course, we cover G3. So G3 is going to be the model uh, that most people are going to be interested in with MLA, with the increased brightness, new, better heat sink. Um, it did look good. It looked really impressive. Um Again, manufacturer demos take it with a pinch of salt, uh, but it did get me excited to get it in and have a look at. Um, they were quoting figures, but they were quoting figures against the B3 to the C3 oh. uh, and the G3 rather than G3 to G2, uh, which is of more relevance to, to our audience. So um, those will be the first measurements I do as soon as I, I get a chance to get hands on with these. Normally we're given that opportunity 
um, round about this time of year, maybe February or whatever, if that opportunity is uh, given to me, I will get along there with the meters and everything and get some early measurements and uh, we'll discuss that. So those were the LG models announced. Um, there's also some slimmed down uh, QNED range. So Ian, maybe you can just fill us in quickly with the details on the QNED. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just a, a little bit smaller than it was last year. Um, no 8K models this year that are planned. There are talks that there might be a QNED 99 still coming an 8K model, but that will be in restricted markets and unlikely to be US and UK. So yeah, essentially you're looking at three core QNEDs this year, the Q8, QNED 85, uh, which is the only uh, mini LED in the range now, uh, along with the uh, Edge LED, QNED 80 and QNED 75. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, they are interesting models to some uh, out there. Um, and obviously, uh, Q, um, QNED, as they call it. Uh, I, you get confused with these things, don't you? QLED yeah. and QNED, so on. But anyway, uh, that's LG's uh, LED LCD lineup. Uh, just looking at some of the questions, just while we keep going on. So, um, CS, love watching the coverage, but it's more the in depth test uh, in your test rooms at Mata. That's from uh, Nigel Henry. Um, yeah, uh, increasing panel sizes as well. Yeah, that's becoming the norm. Uh, larger panel sizes, definitely. Uh, 98 doesn't look big when you're in the US, funny enough, in a suite. Um, massive, everything's, massive. everything's bigger there, though. It is, yeah, including your stomach. It, and you yeah, including off. the people. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'd hate to think how much weight I've put on in the last two weeks. But anyway, um, when you're doing Denny's and IHOP for breakfast every day, you pile it on quite quickly. Um, so, yeah, uh, like I say, our coverage is always, what, what does the manufacturer have to say at the beginning of the year? We'll get the product in and test it and let you know exactly uh, how close it was to what they were saying it would be. Um, trouble with glasses 3 3D is you ain't going to get a proper pop-out effect. Um, yeah, where it will work is with these laptops. Um, the tech chap, um, Tom... Go check out his channel. He's just done a review of one of them. I managed to catch that this morning. It looks really impressive technology um, for the laptops because you've got the two cameras. It measures where your eyes are, sorts the parallax out. It looks like it does a really good job. So go and check out his video. Um, what else are we looking at? Um, uh, no idea what you said at all, but your accent is sexy. Thank you very much, Jordan. Um, my bomba. Uh, he says, I wish somebody would tell us how the iSense UX looked in real life. It looked really impressive. Really impressive. I can't tell you anything about blooming handling uh, or the brightness of the viewing angles. Well, viewing angles, yeah, they, they didn't look too bad. Um, everything else was pumped up to 11. Uh, this was on the show floor. It was shown um, material that had been produced by iSense uh, to make these TVs look absolutely fantastic. It's a trade show. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't any... Some of these manufacturers will have... Uh, backroom demos where you can actually go in and, and get hands on. Uh, Hisense didn't have any of that, unfortunately, so I didn't get a chance to get hands on. Uh, but it does look impressive and it looks great for Hisense. They really are up in the game this year. They are a brand to watch this year. So I'm just hoping after the disappointment of this year's models, which didn't quite uh, reach the standard that I was expecting them to reach, hopefully this year, with them being a global uh, lineup, we should see a, a lot better image quality and they're capable of doing it so i guess the, the question will be can they do it at the same price points or are they going to have to add to those price points are they going to have to be a little bit more expensive for them to then produce the quality that we are expecting and then if that's the case that pushes them up into territory where they're competing against some big manufacturers so We'll wait on that one. We'll wait on prices and so on. So and I can't give you a full um, answer to my mobile. Um, unfortunately, it's a show floor. Um, but as soon as we get this stuff in, uh, it will be reviewed. It'll be measured and we'll give you a complete rundown. Um, what else was the official stands for the G3? No. Uh, last year, it was a bit of a lean back. I know people were turned off by that. Although I've got to say, I lived with it for a few weeks and I didn't find it an issue. And I didn't find it an issue with Sony either with the, the slight lean back on the on the panels, but I know people don't like that. So no, I don't know what the stand design is this year. Like I say, normally around about February time, we get an early look. Um, so stay tuned, we might get a, an early look at this stuff. Um, and I think we're up to date with questions. Right, so let's quickly move on with other um, models. Right, so Samsung S95C, S90C, what's the difference? One Connect box. One comes with a One Connect box, the other doesn't. 
Uh, 95C looks like it has an updated sound system on it. Um, there was very little detail on the stands. Uh, both of them look really, really nice. The design's really nice on both of them. Uh, 95 is a little bit thicker in terms of the chassis um, because everything's built into the back. There's no need to have a bulge at the back because it's got the one connect box, whereas the 90 still has that little bit of a bulge at the bottom of the panel. Panel's a bit thinner. Last year, uh, the 95B did end up getting bent in transit for a few people because it was so thin. Uh, luckily, the one that we've got uh, didn't get bent, but I do know that there has been some issues uh, with panels being bent. So that may be an issue for the 90C because it's very much the same design. Um, the 95C looks to be a different design, a little bit thicker and so on. Uh, the other thing was I uh, had time with Samsung Display. So again, Samsung Display manufacture this stuff. Samsung Electronics, they put it into a TV and sell it. Um, so Samsung Display are the people who then sell them to Sony and Philips and whoever else is going to have a, a QD OLED this year. Um, will Sony have a QD OLED this year? We don't know yet. We're waiting on that announcement. But uh, second gen, it does look good. Um, if they can improve with this a better EV uh, layer, so the blue material, if they can improve the brightness and so on with that, um, added to the QD um, layer and then get your RGB. If they can do that, keep the uniformity, um, keep the uh, accuracy, because I know Samsung Electronics don't do accurate, uh -huh. um, unless they're really pushed. Uh -huh. um, that'll be interesting to see. So uh -huh. And price points as well, because 95B, I think we paid 3000 for, and we got it on day of release. And I think they, they, they were selling for about 1500 quid in the end. So uh -huh. yeah. that was a hell of a difference in price from being an early adopter to what they're actually selling for now. So be interested to see the price points that these come in. I think 90C is going to undercut. Um, 95C may be pitched as a more premium model. We'll wait and see on that one. So that was uh, QD OLED. Again, exciting technology. Um, it's certainly pushing other manufacturers, OLED manufacturers on like LG Display. Um, and Panasonic are still using the LG Display panels. A lot of people thought they might move to QD OLED. I don't know why, I, if I was to have a guess, I would say that they're maybe tied into a deal with LG Display. And this is me guessing. I don't. I have no inside knowledge uh, of this. But if you were to ask me the question, my guess would be that they probably have some kind of ongoing deal that they have to see out before they can uh, take on another panel uh, and produce another TV. So that could be the issue as to why they're sticking with uh, LG Display. Uh, but saying that, the demonstration I had, and again, manufacturer's demonstration, pinch of salt, it really was impressive. Panasonic are always accurate. Uh, they're always, always um, lovely image quality. Uh -huh. Same here, brighter, more colourful. Um, the demonstration footage, again, designed to show off the panel at its best. So again, pinch of salt. Definite uptick compared to uh, the LZ2000. And I, I really like the LZ2000. Um, this is an, another big push-up. Um, which if you just bought an LZ2000, you don't really want me saying that. But yeah, it is a, a, a another push on here. Um, and of course, it's using uh, MLA. The 77-inch um, doesn't have the same panel. And I'm not 100% sure why. And when I asked the question, it was sidestepped. So oh. stay tuned on that one. We will obviously get to the bottom as to why that is. It's probably just because uh, manufacturing process and, and so on. Uh, with MLA, it's maybe just a little bit too much at this moment in time for that screen size. Um, again, we will get early looks at these, hopefully with March time, maybe March, uh, April. It's normally the time that we get a look under NDA and then uh, we then get the review models probably around about late summer, which was certainly the time frame this year. So that's what you're looking for there. It got my best in show. The reason it got best in show, you're saying, well, why did it get best in show? QD OLED's obviously better. Um, Panasonic were actually showing something that was a bit different. They'd taken the time to show you the product properly, demonstrate the product properly, and explain the technology and why their product uh, was a bit different. Um, sadly, nobody else was doing that on the show floor, and certainly not Samsung. It was, here, have a look, and no detail and whatever. So why you go best in show? They were the only one that was really showing any pride in their product and really pushing the product and so on. And what they were saying about the product was certainly what I was seeing. Um, and it looks like a really, really impressive TV. Does that mean that everything else is really bad? Absolutely not. 
Um, a lot of amazing technology. I'm really excited this year. Um, I'm more excited this year than I was last year in uh-huh. terms of getting these TVs in, getting them measured and so on. So, um, so yeah, we've covered Hisense. Uh, TCL, no European range expected um, in a couple of months. Like I say, Marek will come on. We will discuss that. A uh, lot of mini LED technology. Um, I have been impressed with their TVs at the price point. I'll be interested to see if they continue that on. And then again, Sony, uh, no TVs at the show. Uh, but again, four to six weeks, we might have, certainly for the UK, we might have some information. Don't hold me to that. Um, that is just a rumour at the minute, but that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, right, so I think that covers all TV, does it, Ian? Have we covered everything? I was I was muted for a cough and I forgot to turn right. myself back on again. Right. Um, okay. But yeah, I, I think that, that yeah, that, that's a lot of TVs we've been through, so it probably covers just about everything. Yeah, and that covers all the major manufacturers who reached out to us, told us what they were showing at the show and uh, what was um, relevant to our uh, market audience in terms of US and UK and so on, uh, because we do have a, a large US audience as well as UK. Uh, sometimes pe- people think we're just UK based, but no, we will cover US product as well. Um, so yeah, uh, I do know that there are t- TV manufacturers out there. Um, reason why we didn't cover them, again, uh, they probably haven't reached out to us. They're probably not showing us any relevant uh, product for our audience. Um, so it's probably not worth us covering that. Because like I say, time-wise, the constraints placed on your time when you're out there are huge. And we want to make sure we get the right things to you. So uh, from what we've covered this year, Jules, what's sticking out for you at the minute? What's getting you excited in terms of TV? I'd really like to see the G3, the MZ2000, and um, the latest QD OLED panels side by side. I think that'd be very exciting. And I think what they're, what's, it just sounds a bit more of a percentage increase in performance over last year's models than we're usually used to, which is usually very, very incremental, if not, you know, not worth upgrading. So I'm I'm very interested in both these. It sounds it's like a bit of bit of an arms race between um, between LG display and uh, and Samsung display going on here, and it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out in the future. But you know, whichever one you buy, I'm sure they're going to be absolutely cracking displays, every single one of them. Well, this is the thing. I mean, uh, TVs are we're at a point now where you know, once you get them calibrated and set up properly, yeah. There's not a hell of a lot between them. There are slight differences uh-huh. between the different technologies, but you're not talking night and day. And the the, the performance that we're getting nowadays is is astonishing. Oh yeah. Um, and again, what we're talking about are tiny little differences, and I think that gets blown up, especially you know when people are looking for clicks and clickbait and all the rest of it. And oh, this is so much better than what? No, <laughs> not really. Little differences. Um, but every little difference does add up. Martin, what is your takeaway in terms of TV? Uh, well, just from what I was reading and watching, uh, I was very interested in the MZ2000, the micro lens array. Sounds fascinating. Can't wait to see it. Um, yeah, no, it, it yeah. is great when you see it. Because you think, well, really, is it going to make that big a difference? Um, you know, what's a viewing angle is going to be like? Does it affect that? And and so on. And then when you see it in person, and I... Deliberately took a few shots that were side on to the TV uh-huh. uh, for B rolls and so on. There's no degradation in, in image quality or brightness or anything like that. They, they really have nailed it. It's really. Um, but but I've always brilliant. liked Panasonic as well. I yep. like the way they still make Blu ray players, very good Blu ray players. Mm-hmm. Yep. And they've got that Hollywood uh, office as well. So they're obviously really plugged into the studios and they really get deep into it. And uh, I've yep. always liked that. Their plasmas were fantastic. Yeah, no, Panasonic have always been uh, very much creator's intent. It's something that uh, I've always admired from the company, right from the, they asked us to consult for them, I think it was 2009. And it was myself and David McKenzie who went along and, and we this was way before you had calibration controls on the TVs. And we went in and, and gave them a, a, a talk on, as enthusiasts, what we were looking for and, and what we wanted to see in TVs. And you could see that um, the engineers had obviously had a heavy night the night before because nobody was paying any attention to what we were saying until we moved on to the competition and Uh showed them what the competition were doing in terms of menus and accuracy and so on. And from that point, and I think THX also had some involvement with them at that point, and uh, I know that Joel Silver had 
had been pushing them as well. So I think they, they had it from all angles at that point. And since then, they've really taken the feedback on from all the different companies and, and us and, and enthusiasts. And they've taken it on board and the whole Hollywood message and got involved with Hollywood. I mean, they had the big professional department anyway that produces a lot of the cameras that are used and uh, grading monitors and so on. But they really took that message on and, and well done to them because it's paid them dividends really in terms of picture accuracy. And there's just something about a Panasonic image as well. Yeah, um, cinematic. It does. It, it looks really, really good. So yeah, yeah. I'm excited for that TV as yeah. well. Ian, you were reading all the press releases, you were watching all the live feeds and all the rest of it. Um, doesn't have to be TV related at, at, at all, but what was the thing that really stood out for, for you in terms of the show? Um, I think probably even though you guys have talked a lot about some of the the, the, the top end technology, which is all obviously very exciting year on year. But I was struck, I think, by the likes of uh, TCL and Hisense, who are managing to kind of push the boundaries of what you hope will be slightly more affordable levels. Um, and if they can continue to make inroads there, which it looks like they're going to do, and hopefully that will then impact like the bigger guys to kind of start delivering slightly better value for money as well, perhaps. So yeah, you're hoping that there's going to be you know a bit of a narrowing of the ground between like the, the top level guys and then the next sort of the B list uh, manufacturers that will hopefully you know make life better for everybody in the longer run. So I'm I'm hoping to see more. But obviously, we'll have to wait until the prices come in. To see yeah, just but I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head there, though. I think competition is a thing, and Jules, yeah. uh, you know, he picked up on it as well. You've, you've got QD OLED from Samsung now, so LG have an app of their game. Um, huh? you know, LG, have, you know, they've yep. got real competition on their hands. And this is great for the end consumer. It's great for us enthusiasts because it pushes them on. It, it, it encourages them to spend a bit more on R and D and, and come up with something a bit different, like micro uh -huh. lens array and so on, um, which has proven to be really, really good technology. So yeah, competition is really worth it. Absolutely. But the, the other thing, uh, Phil, that, that I find encouraging is that I remember reading articles maybe two or three years ago, you know, predicting this is kind of the end for OLED. We, we, they're not going to get brighter. They're not going to, you know, and here we yeah. are talking now about, you know, potentially, you know, 1300, 1500 nits on an OLED um, yeah. with all these developments. And I find that really, really, really exciting. Yeah, never predict the death of a format or a technology because you'll always end up with egg on your face. Um, seen it many times before, although I'm still pretty confident that my uh, predictions about 3D will remain accurate. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's coming back, but anyway. Well, your PSVR um, 2, I think, is your best bet for Avatar 2, isn't it? If you, if you get one of those headsets, you can watch maybe Avatar in 3D. I've got to say the specs. I didn't get a chance to do a demo. The queue was miles long when we went to the Sony stand. Um, and again, we just had a brief look there. But it did look impressive. And again, the specs look really impressive. Was it 2000 by 2040 pixels on these OLEDs? Yeah. yeah so if you if you get so, a 3D Blu-ray, um, yeah. that's that's plenty. It's going to look good. You know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll be I remember, I remember Yo and Alan said to me, Yo and Alan from Dolby said to me, uh, 3D keeps coming back like athlete's foot. <laughs> he was a fun guy <laughs> yeah boom boom tish we're here all week yeah? <laughs> but i'm trying not to laugh because i'm gonna get, get a coffee <laughs> fit and that'll be me. so we still got a couple of um things to briefly go over and that's audio wise um actually uh, we've just talked about uh, psvr2 um and the project leonardo controller just uh, cover that for us ian just fill us in on what that was uh, what Project Leonardo? It's it's yeah. quite an interesting uh, aside. I mean, it's it's not like a massive uh, announcement, but it's very very practical and very very you know going to be appreciated. Basically, what they've done is released uh, a modular control system, so you can take it apart and rebuild it as you see fit. You can customize the buttons however you see fit. You can also it's compatible with the existing dual sense controllers. You can mix and match your components, and it's designed to help people who might not necessarily be able to play video games in the normal way be able to tailor a control to, to suit whatever kind of disability or other kind of restriction that they might have. So, you know, kudos to, to Sony for coming up with this and appreciating that, you know, not everybody can sit there with a standard dual sense and play video games in the normal way. Uh, but it might also help, you know, competitive gamers as well who might want to have a unique setup for a specific game that they can tailor yeah. a controller for them. So, yeah, it's a, an interesting development from yeah, you know, absolutely. see it, how it's applied. It's something that's always put me off the, the new games consoles is the controllers and just how complicated they can be, you know, all the different triggers and, and sliders and buttons. And so I guess if, if you can you know, put that in a, a configuration that works for you, 
and get you more involved in gaming, then yeah, it's got to be a good thing. So good on Sony for that. Um, right. Uh, so to wrap up, let's head over to audio. Uh, so Derek, uh, they announced active room treatment. Um, so very briefly to go over this, because um, it was probably one of the most impressive demos I've seen at CES for a number of years. Um, basically, uh, you measure at the moment with Derek on a speaker basis, Jules, and it makes the calculations based on the speaker response within the room. And then it gives you um, what it thinks is, is the best possible trim for that room. Um, what it, this does is it does exactly that, but at the same time, it measures the actual room um, in such a way that it thinks, well, there's still reflections going on um, within the room. And these reflections all build up, whether they're coming from the ceiling, the floor, the side walls, the back walls, behind the TV, um, there's reflections everywhere. And, and this is going on and on and on. And of course, uh, all of these uh, different reflections impact on each other and cause distortion to the sound, no matter how well uh, designed the room may be or how well set out the speakers are or how well the Dirac trim is is applied um, to the system. There's always something in there. Um, the clever thing is that what this does is it, it, it basically plays back through the other speakers in the room all these reflections from the main speakers. So if you've got a left and right speaker, the left speaker is cancelling out what's happening reflection-wise with the right speaker, and the right speaker's doing that with the left speaker. It sounds a bit odd until you hear it. Um, in the demo, they switched off the main speaker, so all you heard was what the speakers were then generating to try and kill out um, these the re reverberations that were happening in the room. So you could hear this sort of rumbling going on and so on, you think, okay. And then you get up and walk around the room when all the speakers are, are active, whether it's stereo or, or multi-channel, and it was only a 7.1 system that was in that room. And it was phenomenal. I've never heard anything like it. It's, and wow. and um, unfortunately, it, it is exclusive until Q3 uh -huh. to Storm Audio. Um, so if you've got Storm, then great. You know, you're you going to be able to get it. Uh, Q3, everybody else who has a, a Derek vendor will be able to add this technology into the processors and so on. Um, again, it's going to be a product that's in the higher end of the market. Um, but yeah, I mean, this system that we were listening to was probably about 80 to 90 grand's worth in terms of processor amplification and speakers. It was the Perliston speakers that Doug had reviewed recently uh, that were being used, Storm Audio processor and so on. So it wasn't a, a cheap system, but it was phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal what it was able to do. And you don't realise just how much noise is still there, even after EQ, even after a little bit of room treatment and so on. And the ability for all the other speakers to cancel this out, even if you're just using two channels, it, the, the fact that one speaker can cancel the other speaker's issues and work, it, it's really, really impressive. And um, we're going to get uh, Nilo on from Derek, hopefully, on a future right. podcast. And we'll get into depth, uh, some depth with this. Um, and it's a shame that Doug's not here because I know Doug's a big fan um, or this type of technology and he really wanted to be here and discuss it. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it tonight. So we will circle back on this one. Unfortunately, there's no video. Uh, we were up against it time-wise and so on. Um, but this really does sound amazing technology. Um, it will eventually trickle down um, to uh, a lot more consumers and, and enthusiasts. So stay tuned. It is definitely something to keep your ears open to because it does make a big difference. Uh, Martin, were your contacts, have you been able to hear this yet or not? No, absolutely no. not. Um, yeah, knew it was coming, uh, but yeah, nothing more than that. But I'd love to hear it. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it really does sound like it's, uh, you know, getting up into that, into the, uh, up into those high end type uh, room calibration systems. So it sounds really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, anything that tames the, the, the lower frequencies, which is the, uh -huh. The area where you really struggle, uh -huh. this really does it. You know, this is the first time I've actually thought, you know what, that that's absolutely completely balanced the whole system out. Uh -huh. And walking around the, the the room, you know, it was, a, it was wide enough for for more than just the sweet spot. You actually got that in, in quite a wide area. So, uh, right, and, the, uh, yeah, and at the moment, obviously, it's only available for Storm Audio. I might get to listen to that if I go to ISC. 
in Barcelona at the end of the month. Yeah, uh, is that other manufacturers are getting on board with Dirac? You know, Denon and the rest of them are, are also yeah. by getting into yeah. that. So you know, it's it's not just going to be hopefully re- not restricted just to Storm Audio. Yeah, if you're going to ISE, um, I'd love to get your thoughts on Trenov, um, yeah. the, their new system, which sounds very similar. Uh-huh. So what Derek are doing here, so um, yeah, again, sounds, it's another high-end option, but I'd be really interested by that but about killing room nodes. But then if you're putting 16 subwoofers into a room, <laughs> you need it. Yeah, you've got you got, you, got, you got a good chance. Um, yeah. So you know, question of whether that's going to be scalable down to 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 smaller Pro- numbers. Probably not. But again, you know, ISE is the place to get demonstrations yeah. like that. So I'll be interested to get your thoughts on on the, uh-huh. the podcast for me. When we come up to that, so the last thing we need to discuss tonight, uh, very briefly, but uh, go watch the video. Um, it's done surprisingly well, the video. I think a lot of people are interested in this, which is the Nakamishi Dragon uh, 11.4.6. It's a surround sound system. Um, uh, Raymond didn't like me calling it a sound bar, yeah. but it is a sound bar <laughs> with extra speakers. Um, now, they have... They've, they've really approached this project with a lot of love and passion and very little business sense. And that was his words, not mine. Um, they haven't had a business plan when they've, they've thought of this. They haven't looked at the cost and anything. They've gone out to produce the best possible uh, home theatre system that they could that would be uh, something that could proudly wear the Dragon name. If people are not aware, Nakamishi Dragon was originally a tape deck. It was then a turntable and then a CD player. Um, these products were super high end um, because they were mechanical products and it was all in the engineering. Nakamishi were really famous for the engineering that they put into these things, uh, you know, uh, the mechanics of it, how, they, how, how that worked and how that impacted on sound quality and so on. Um, Dragon is a name that is well known in, in high end hi-fi for a long, long time. Uh, the company did go bankrupt maybe a couple of times if I've got my history correct. Uh, latest uh, iteration is Chinese owned. Um, but like I say, the team behind it and certainly the CEO, uh, Raymond, who I interviewed at the show and had a, a longish discussion with, um, uh, they, they believe in this product. They've put a lot of heart and soul into it. They want to produce something that, that is a little bit special. And what the, the main aim was, People can't fit an AVR and seven or eight main speakers and subwoofers and ceiling speakers and all the rest of it into a modern living room. Um, this is not a small system by any means, but it's a more compact system. It's all wireless, apart for the power cables. And then you've got each of the units. Um, the surround speakers are really quite clever in terms of how they're designed. Um, so they work as the sides and the rears in terms of reflections. Uh, double drivers in them, uh, 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 tweeters and so on. They also have the up firing speaker on top. The beauty with the up firing speaker is that it, it can be moved 180 degrees in terms of where uh, directionally it's firing, so you can get it absolutely bang on so it hits the ceiling just above where you need it to hit, uh, depending on the placement of the speaker. If you go and buy one of these systems at the minute from the likes of um, Samsung and LG and so on, you're kind of restricted about where you can place the surrounds and the, and, and so on because um, you don't have that full flexibility in terms of changing the channel volumes and, and positions and that kind of thing. You're kind of fixed to where things need to be. This gives you a lot more flexibility. Like I say, you can turn the, the upward firing speaker uh, so it's bouncing where you want it to bounce. You've got the front channels, as you would expect, LCR, but you also got up fire and sideways firing. Uh, you got two subwoofers with uh, dual opposing uh, drivers. This is where it gets a bit, is it four subwoofers? It, it's uh. two subwoofers with two drivers in them, if we're being completely honest about it. Um, they can use whatever market and they like. Um, it's it's two subwoofers with you know uh, two drivers in them. Um, but yeah, it, it, the thing that got me was just the sound quality was very, very, very good. It's $3,500, quite a bit of money for a soundbar, but not quite the same money as going out and buying a 7.1 or 7.2 channel with an AVR. Um, it's it's also, in terms of processing, it has the same processing power as an AVR. Um, so uh, Dolby and DTSX, um, both companies have also 
uh, work with Nakamichi to make sure that the processing works for the product in terms of channel and object based uh, effects and all that kind of thing. And th that's where, you know, he gave us a, the, the intro, the PowerPoint, um, but where it really made a lot of sense was in the, in the demonstration. Um, really, really good demonstration. It was in a suite that looked like a normal US living room. Um, so a bit bigger than a UK living room, but not massive, if you know what I mean. A lot of uh, reflective surfaces. Uh, there was a bit of a rug and a uh, couple of bits that did absorb some of the sound. But, it, you know, it wasn't a treated room or anything like, like that. Um, and it was really, really impressive. And I, I think the, the main thing I'll take away is uh, that Michelle was out with me, helping me out on the show this year. And uh, she doesn't like noise. She doesn't like um, big, boombastic home cinema rooms like the room I have currently it's too loud it's too obnoxious um she came away and said oh i could i could live with that um that was really really impressive so you know that's a non-av person given a, a, their their opinion after the demo as well it's really really impressive um yeah there's a lot of marketing behind it i can't blame the guys they're taking a bit of a risk with this um they've put a lot of eggs in one basket um so they are going to market the hell out of it um and you know you can't blame them for that but it does sound good. Um, does it come with a room correction system built in? Uh, they wouldn't answer that question. Um, no. I do have a contact email. I have a number of questions on the back of the video that I need to get answers to. That is one of them. The other was, does it have HDMI 2.1? Uh, that wasn't covered during the presentation. Like I say, I've got contact with them. Uh, I'm going to get some answers to those questions. Might even try and get Raymond onto a podcast just to discuss it. A little bit more if he's available to do that and it works out and there's we're able to do that and, and maybe deep dive a little bit more into the into the product because it was one of those standout products um you know nakamishi dragon it is a name that a lot of people recognize and have a lot of respect for again you know they're, they're, they're trying to do something that's a bit different that's not totally out there in terms of costs um but at the same time they don't want to potentially ruin the dragon name either by putting out a, a substandard product I don't think they're doing that. I think the product um, is really, really good. Had it been a, a a blind demo, and I said this to them, and, and they've gone and used it on one of the marketing lines, God bless them, but um, I said, if this had been a blind demo and you told me that was an AVR and a 5.1, 7.1 system, I, I would maybe have believed you. And that's kind of the, the level that you're talking about. Um, you're not talking about a processor and power amps and all the rest of it. You're talking about a, a mid-range Denon or, or Yamaha AVR with a 5.1, 7.1 speaker system. You're getting that level of performance um, from it. And what was Im impressive was the height channels, the way that they've designed the drivers to bounce, uh, that you can manipulate the rear uh, or side speakers in terms of uh, where that, that Atmos is going to bounce from. So yeah, really, really interesting product. Um, and I know at least Stuart said he wants one, so <laughs> their marketing is working anyway. Uh, we're going to try and get one of these in for review as well. Um, the problem with that is it's not going to be sold in the UK officially just yet. However, having seen the amount of interest there is, um, I'm hoping they're going to change their mind on that one because, like I say, the video's done well over 100,000 views um, so far. There is interest in this. Um, and Nakamishi Dragon is a name that is is well known worldwide, so... Uh, we'll wait and see and we'll see if we can get a, a demo. Can I review it, please? Oh, well, I think there'll be quite a few people fighting for this one, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, certainly if, if they're going to send one over, then then yeah, we'll we'll have those conversations about who's going to who's gonna review it. But yeah, it's it was impressive. Um, I don't think they were doing anything underhand. I had a, had a bit of a walk around the room just to make sure that, you know, there wasn't any extra speakers hidden away somewhere or whatever. And um, I have seen that in demos in the past. Um, they were genuine, they were honest, they were really nice people. Um, they put a lot of effort into this product. I wish them well with it because um, I think it's it's quite a, a promising uh, prospect and something that I've been waiting for, for a company to take it on, to be honest. I think you've, you've had a, a deluge of soundbars, but they're all kind of much of a muchness, aren't they? Um, there's nothing that really kind of stands out. This is the first thing that is actually going for the AVR market and saying, well, actually, you know, this it, it, it's thirty five hundred dollars, but this can get pretty close if you don't want to have all the boxes and the wires and everything else. And yeah, 
I mean, there's some there's some good systems out there, Phil. I mean, today I calibrated a or set up for somebody a Samsung 990, mm. um, and that was really quite quite good for what it is. It's really quite good, um, but you got to get you got to get all the speakers in the right places. Um, the the options to you know um, tweak the gains on the different speakers doesn't quite exist to the same extent as you would normally have on a on a separate system. Yeah. So there are compromises, but you if you do it. You can you can get a nice sound out of some of them. Yep, um, and again, this this is the first time where I think a manufacturer, certainly with the surrounds, has taken on board placement, and not everybody's going to have a perfectly rectangular room mm. with the TV positioned where it should be and the speakers positioned where they should be. You know, this is uh, this is something that will work in in various layouts. So, so yeah, it was a really interesting product. So. Before we wrap up, any anybody got any other points? Any anything else that you saw that we haven't spoken about um, from CES? Um, that just on. very quickly, the um, the Razer Leviathan V2. Uh, I know it's a gaming thing, so it's not usually something that would pique my interest. But uh, it does have THX spatial audio, and they did say they were going to take this from just a headphone platform into an open space platform with real speakers in front of you. And it's, this looks like this is one of the first, if not the first product mm. that is a speaker driven uh, product. So I'm very interested to hear how effective it was. Did you hear it? I didn't get an opportunity, unfortunately. It was one of the things that was on the backup list if we had time um, to hit the show floor. We didn't have time to hit the show floor, unfortunately. Um, it was just the, the way it is. The other thing is it, it was a weekend show this year. So just to explain that to people, um, normally CES would be four days during the week. Uh, this year it was two days on a weekend. Um, what normally happens is uh, everybody goes home on the Friday. Yeah. So the show is dead Saturday, Sunday. Not the case this time around. I think people were so desperate um, for face-to-face -face contact, for uh, meetings, for getting out there and actually seeing product and getting hands-on with product and looking and so on. It was actually busy um, over the weekend as well, which surprised me. Because uh, I have done shows in the past that have gone over a weekend, and it happens every four or five years where it has that format. And like I say, everybody gets on a plane on the Friday and their way home because um, they want to be home for the weekend. They don't want to be on a trade show. Not the case this year, um, uh, but unfortunately, we didn't have the time to have a look at that product. Um, but it did look interesting because it had head tracking technology as yeah. well, didn't it? So yeah. again, that's something that, that um, it's interesting to see how I mentioned that laptop um, with the 3D, how they're now using tracking technology with other cameras and so on. And it's something that's come from the gaming side of things, Ian, really, isn't it? Um, where you had the cameras that, that looked at where you were within the room and worked out um, for gaming and, and so on. And, and it looks like that's moving over to, like you say, sound bar, so they, they can see where you're sitting within the room and, and tailor the sound to that. And uh, with three these three D displays, glass glasses, free three D, where it's measuring where your eyes are and where you're looking, this is really really interesting. It's taken us another ten years to get to that point from when three D was popular, but these are all things that I've really noticed this year um, becoming a, a bit more obvious. And we saw it last year as well, Jules, with TVs. A lot of them have more advanced cameras within them, and certainly room sensors in terms of measuring color measuring the white point and so on in terms of uh, Dolby IQ and so on, Dolby yeah. Vision IQ and so on. So again, this is another area that it's interesting to see it trickling every year on year. It's starting to find its way into more and more technology. Anything we missed, uh, Ian, whether it was core or other things that were announced? Um, not that immediately springs to mind. I was going to mention the Razor as well. as the one thing that caught my eye. So we've already covered that one. Um, so uh, no, is the sure answer. I think we've covered everything that I had in my head. Okay, but there's obviously excellent. going to be more on the website. People want to check out everything we covered at the show. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just going back over some of these questions, uh, European Hisense models will be unified. Absolutely. Um, it is a global uh, TV this year uh, for Hisense, which is great. That's what we fed back to them this year based on the models. Um, so, yeah, it will be interesting to see that. Uh, someone tried to get Samsung to put accurate filmmaker mode on near QLEDs like the S95B. I uh, can't answer that one. Um, can we get the Irish product manager from Sony, that's Gavin, um, to make announcements? We'll see. We'll see if we can get Gavin on to talk about uh, TVs a little bit later uh, from Sony once they announce some TVs. 
Uh, TCL product man- manager is brilliant. Yeah, Marek is really, really good. We will be getting him on the podcast. Um, he, he, not a salesman. He'll tell you, tell you straight what the product's about. Um, always appreciate that from uh, anybody in the industry. Um, what is the brightest second gen QD OLED versus 2023 ML? I didn't see them side by side. So MLA OLED and QD OLED uh, will be interesting to see them side by side. They're quoting round about the same kind of numbers. Um, again, it's marketing. Again, it's a trade show. Um, we'll be able to answer that a little bit further in the year once we get the products in. Um, Stevie DR Dragon look interesting. It is interesting. Hopefully, they will um, look at maybe a wider launch for that product. Um, and Nigel says, really make you think about the choice between receiver amp. I think this is where a lot of people are. I don't know about you, Jules, in terms uh-huh. of what you see in people's homes, but certainly we're, we're starting to move away from people having big systems. I, I, unless I have a dedicated room yeah. in their home, I have noticed over the last five to uh-huh. 10 years that people are starting to downgrade a little bit in terms of the number of boxes in the room, um, certainly in the main living rooms. Um, and yeah, I think the the point always has been, well, separates or AVRs or whatever are always going to sound better than a soundbar, but are we getting to the point now where that's less of an issue? Well, it's certainly, it's certainly well, with my wife, it's more of an issue that she doesn't want speakers and wires around, and, and a lot of forum members with their partners can probably vouch for the same, the same problem. But, yeah, I'm seeing fewer separate systems um, connected up to TVs uh, more and more soundbars, and there is a um, there is a probably a, you know a gap in the market there for a higher end soundbar that delivers um, a roughly equivalent sound um, uh, without having to have all the uh, you know all the the walls in all the right places. I don't know how they do it. It sounds like magic to me, but um, yeah. but there is, there there is a demand there. People want a simpl- a simplicity um of approach to this and um i mean i'm still a fan of separates i can't hide that um but um there you know what i in what i heard today with the samsung which i've dealt with many times before was a pretty damn good sound for the price you're not going to get yeah. that from a from a really you have to buy a really budget um abr and you wouldn't get the the upward firing um speakers and you wouldn't be able to do it for the same price yeah yeah that's always been the attraction it's just is the sound quality getting there, Martin, nowadays? Is it something that people are going to be more happy with? Well, um, actually, I think Jules makes a good point about the placement because I have to say most of the sound bars I've heard have been rather underwhelming in kind of all, you know, price uh, price brackets. So uh, I'm all ears to something that really does have some quality and um, uh, good dynamics and weight. I, I've... Um, yeah, most soundbars have left me pretty underwhelmed. They're not very good at doing ceiling-bound effects for Atmos and DTS, D, uh, DTSX. Yeah. Okay, well, I think uh, I think we've definitely covered everything that we need to cover tonight. It's been a, about half an hour longer than, we, uh, than we'd planned, but then we had a lot to... Uh, to get through so um it looks like we've managed to do that um so my thanks tonight to ian martin and jules thanks very much guys cheers thank you cheers. Bye. Uh, there's no movies podcast tonight this was just uh, the ces special um so please hit that like button if you uh, have enjoyed the chat tonight if you have any questions whatsoever uh, that you want to put to me or the team here uh, then put them in the podcast thread underneath this podcast on AV forums or you can put them in the description uh, under the description in the uh, chat area on youtube or you can send them on an email to podcast at avforums.com and uh, we'll answer them as quickly as we can uh, also don't forget uh, subscribe to the channel please um it does us a lot of good if you do subscribe if you're interested in what we're covering we've got lots of plans for the new year in terms of more video uh, coverage uh, we're going to have more shots we're going to tell you a lot more about what we're having for review and we're looking at changing the format for the podcast uh, don't panic uh, we're not going away anywhere um, actually you're going to get an extra podcast uh, and there's going to be a podcast every week if we uh, if we go ahead with the plans that we do have for this year. Um, so, uh, yeah, subscribe so you don't miss any of that. Leave us a like on this one if you don't mind, if you're still watching. Um, again, that helps. It helps with the algorithm. It helps find new victims for this AV hobby of ours. 
Um, and that's about it. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, bookmark AV forums, do all the usual things that you normally do. Uh, it would be appreciated. I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for watching and listening. And we'll be back again with you on Monday, the 30th of January for the movies and hardware podcasts. Good night.